Hello there, welcome to uh, the, the last day of, of the Route 6 training tasters, which are a little 45 minute introductions to uh, the kind of training courses that we, we, we do at Route 6, either at uh, our own offices or we, we often come to uh, client premises to train their engineers and staff. And, and today's piece, interfacing standards unpicked from SDI to DisplayPort via HDMI. And, and, and the first thing that's probably worth noting is that we've got a couple of, a couple of different ideas here. FDI is the, the signal standard that we all use in broadcast. Uh, you know, it's ubiquitous through outside broadcast, studios, post-production. Uh, but the newer standards, HDMI, DisplayPort, DVI, those kind of things, they're very much display standards, and they're not really signal interchange standards. But it's the kind of technology that broadcast engineers are having to deal with and, and something that we all need to be aware of. So that's, that's what we're going to spend the next 45 minutes going over. And, and there'll be a, a small uh, time for questions at the end. The points that, that, that I most often get asked when, when we're integrating systems, when we're building uh, edit suites and studios for, for other people, um, are, are the points that I hope to go over. Really uh, about extending some of those more um, computer-based display technologies, how you can get those to go long distances, and some of the pitfalls of handling what is essentially a non-broadcast standard within a broadcast environment. Um, I apologize because the, the screens are a bit smaller than we thought and 14-point text probably isn't very visible at the back. Uh, but uh, all of these notes are available on, on the Route 6 technical blog, um, which uh, we'll put the URL up at the end if you want to go back and, and download those and, and go over them. But uh, hopefully the words will be sufficient. Um, so really, we start off with, with CCIR Rec 601, which is a, w w was the original digital video standard from, uh, from nearly 30 years ago now, uh, and, and really started to be picked up by manufacturers in, in the late 80s, and, and was you know, ubiquitous all through the 90s, and has scaled very well up to the, the HD um, standards that we use today. So, so there we are. There's, there's a little overview of, of what 601 brings uh, to television. It's a f it was originally a 4 by 3 aspect ratio standard. Um, that's the resolution, 720 pixels and 576 television lines in, in, in PAL land in, in, in Europe, uh, slightly different in America. And, and the color space is, is uh, not the red, green, blue color space you'd find uh, on a computer display, but it's, it's the luminance, the Y signal as it's referred to as, and, and the CB and the CR color difference channels, which are all encoded together to give us this SDI uh, digital video stream that allows, you know, lossless movement of video throughout a facility. Now, um, SDI has scaled, as I said, very well. Um, it encompasses several standards, and it, it's still with us today. Um, there's, th there's a few things worth noting at the bottom of the slide there, that SDI doesn't really compare very favorably with, with computer uh, display formats, which tend to be uh, RGB. Uh, they tend to assume square pixels, and they tend to assume uh, a color space uh, that, that would be different to the kind of things we'd use in television. But Back in the back in the mid '80s, this was all kind of academic because you know there wasn't even ver version one of Photoshop around. You know we, we weren't really used to using um, domestic computer equipment in the television production process. But anyway, as, as I say, SDI is a, a format that scaled very well, and there's some of the sort of substandards of SDI, starting at 270 megabits, which is standard def definition television, running all the way through to the 3G standards that we have nowadays, where you can do 1080 uh, uh, high, high, high definition video with 50 or 60 progressive frames per second, uh, with a, a data rate of nearly three gigabits per second. And, and typically, that's the, that's the kind of connector that uh, the SDI video is passed around a facility on. It's a, it's a BNC connector. And, and again, if you've ever worked in, in an OB truck or, or in, an, in an edit suite or a studio, that's the kind of connector that, that all the video travels down. In fact, the photo on the right there was uh, from a facility that we're building last week. That, that photo was taken. So still a very contemporary standard. The, uh, the real development in SDI uh, over the last few years has been a standard called 3G, uh, which allows a much higher data rate and, by extension, uh, a, much, uh, a much more fully featured um, uh, movement of video through a facility. SIMT372 is the standard that covers uh, uh, 3G, and in fact, it, there's about 60 variants of 3G, but they all essentially uh, you know, allow a description of digital video at high resolution, uh, uh, but, but extended to cover lots of features that, that weren't ever envisaged when, when SDI first uh, was thought of, and, and there are some of the details there. Now, this, this slide here 
is, is a, a screen capture from a Tektronix um, waveform monitor. Again, if you've, if you've ever worked in a large television facility, it'll be the kind of thing you're used to. It's the kind of thing engineers look at all the time. Uh, but the display we have up here is, is what they call the physical layer measurement, the, uh, the top left-hand corner of that, of that display is what's referred to as an eye diagram. And it's not, it's not unique to television. Lots of digital uh, test signal measurements is done using an eye diagram. And it, it essentially reveals the, the, the overall health, the quality of the, of the signal that's being transmitted down the digital video cable. Um, it's, if, you, if you think about the, the, the digital data stream of, of a, a synchronous video signal, essentially the eye diagram is, is a sample of that overlaid on itself many times. So you're seeing the rising and the falling edges of the data as it goes to one and as it goes to zero. And, and because it's been overlaid many times on itself, you get a feeling for, uh, as I say, the health of the signal. Um, if, if the cable's a bit too long or the transmission path isn't quite right, the eye tends to close up. And, and, and that's another reason why it's referred to as an eye diagram. The eye closes down, and, and your chances of getting a corrupt video signal at the other end go up. But in the case of the, the display we're looking at here, that's, that's a very healthy uh, HDSDI signal. In fact, that's a 3G signal uh, measured on a, on a very uh, contemporary, a very modern Tektronix test set. That's the, the state of a 3G signal, which has, has gone down a very small test cable. Um, two years ago, we were approached by Tektronix and our, our, our cable supplier, Bryant Broadcast, to do some serious sort of testing to destruction of various samples of, of HD cable that was then, at that point, being pushed as being suitable for this 3G standard. Uh, and to our surprise, we couldn't find any other published work that showed uh, how well the various manufacturers' cables performed at 3G. They, 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 were, they were the manufacturers' uh, sort of graphs that say, in theory, this is how well it's performing at 4.5 gigahertz, an analog, an analog bandwidth. But we could never get any solid data as to how far a 3G signal would go down a piece of Belden 1694 cable, for example. And so we embarked on a, on, on a long process of testing about six different high definition uh, rated cables to destruction with, with, with a 3G uh, signal generator and test set. And in fact, although that's all a bit packed in, that diagram there reveals quite a lot. So just taking you through that, top left, uh, or, or the, the, the top um, row of, of, of this diagram here uh, is, is a, a cable, a meter long, made out of various different kinds of cable. And you can't see, but the, uh, the, the markers along the top basically are, are manufacturers and their part numbers. And then as we go down the, 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 uh, the, the vertical axis of, of the chart, we're increasing the cable length, 1 to 5 meters to 10 meters to 20 meters, all the way to 70 meters at the very bottom of the chart. And in fact, if we go back to the, the single test result there, you can see that's a very healthy eye pattern. That means the, uh, the 3G signal is, is, is not being impeded in its transit down the cable at all. And as we go back to the, the, the multi-view, you can see that as you go down in length, and in fact, as you go down uh, along the horizontal in manufacturer, you can see how there's a degradation in the eye pattern. And so as we go down the left-hand side, or indeed down any of those columns, you can see the eye patterns closing up. And that's the effect of the length of the cable. 3G signal is a very challenging signal to have to send down a piece of coaxial cable. And by the time you get to a 70-meter cable, even with the very best quality cable, uh, you're getting to the point where um, the, the signal starts to uh, have unacceptable amounts of errors that aren't easily corrected by the receiving piece of equipment's error detection and recovery process. So using this chart, you can you can see exactly how far you could expect any piece of, of, of well-known video coaxial cable to perform at any given length with a 3G signal. Um, the chart goes on actually to 200 meters, but, but uh, there was little point in showing you that because it actually becomes pretty uh, uh, unusable after 70 meters. But that's, that really gives you a feel for, for how good 3G HDSDI is at going down copper um, coaxial cable. So that's, that's SDI, that's, that's 3G HD SDI, the, the current incarnation of the ubiquitous standard that's been with us for nearly 30 years, SDI, Serial Digital Video. Here's a chart now, which really I've just thrown in for, for information, and it shows you uh, computer um, uh, resolutions. Um, 
CGA, which was uh, what you would have enjoyed on your um, you know, IBM AT in the mid 80s, all the way up to the very high resolution monitors that, that, that we have on our desks now, 24 inch, 1920 by 1200 monitors. And as I say, you'll have to, you'll have to download the notes to, to get the full uh, benefit of this chart, because the chart also shows um, uh, you know, the, the aspect ratios of, the, of those various standards and, and, and where um, video rasters fit into that as well. As, as mentioned earlier, um, video, uh, as we deal with it, HDSDI, 3G maybe at the moment, is, is a standard that's used not only as a display standard, but it's also the, it's the, also the interlink standard. It's the, it's the way that uh, video gets out of a television camera into a video recorder. It's the way video goes from the, uh, fr from, from the, from the video uh, tape player into an Avid. It's, it's not only a display standard, it's an interchange standard. But the way, where we find ourselves now is we're, cont we're contending, as, as integration engineers and as support engineers, we're contending with um, various computer display formats. And, and they're really only ever intended as display formats, but they still cause a lot of problems. So there we go. That, that top, top right-hand connector is, is, the, uh, is the VGA connector. It's been with us for a long time and, and has scaled particularly well. You know, that's still, still used a bit, although DVI, um, the 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 the, uh, the representation which is below it is is now more common the the, the sort of the digital version of, of VGA, and in fact, most most DVI outputs on computer graphics cards or other pieces of equipment um, will tend to have the analog signal coming along for the ride as well. So, if you see the uh, the two connectors um, uh, bottom left there, uh, they're two variations of the DVI connector. But the interesting part is the is the little four pins with the, the little spade between them on the left hand side. And if you look at your com you know the graphics card in your computer at home, uh, you'll notice that. And in fact, that means that card is equally able to provide an analog signal, which would is akin to the the VGA signal that we would have had, as well as the digital signal. And in fact, you can buy little breakout adapters. There's 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 a picture of one there that allow you to extract that analog VGA signal from the DVI connector. DVI also goes a bit further in as, in as much as it allows much higher resolutions. So if you have a really expensive computer with a, with a, with a dual link graphics card in it, you can drive monitors you know, right up to kind of nearly 4K of, of resolution. And, and that's what you get out of the, the bottom two connectors, the fact that all the pins are present, all 29 pins are there to drive the, uh, the monitor. DVI uses this, uses this idea of, of, of TMDS data lanes. So the red, the green, the blue, and the control data data go down um, uh, balanced um, uh, uh, TMDS data lanes, which we'll talk a little bit about later. I've, I've just kind of thrown in a bit of jargon there and, and not really uh, uh, completed it, but we'll talk about that later. But anyway, DVI has been around for a few years and, 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 and serves us very well. But the thing that, that, that really seems to have been uh, um, you know, t taking the market with the introduction of Blu-ray and those kind of things is HDMI. You buy a modern television and it's probably got three HDMI ports on the back, if not more. And, and pretty much any piece of equipment, uh, like a Blu-ray player or a, a set-top box from your cable provider, um, will have a DVI out, uh, will have an HDMI output on it. Uh, HDMI is, uh, from a signal point of view, pretty much the same as DVI. Electrically, it's identical, and, and, and from a data transit point of view, it's identical as well. Um, it's gone through several revisions, and, 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 and there are kind of all that. That's the feature matrix. Uh, we're currently up to version 1.4 of HDMI, and that's got lots of clever things. It can support three, 3D and, and 4K resolution, and, and, it, and it allows the, the television to talk back to the AV receiver over an Ethernet connection. It, it really is very fully featured interface. Um, but its, its humble beginnings are, are the fact that it's, it's kind of DVI in a different form. And, and all the things you can send over HDMI, you can pretty much send over DVI as well. And, and in fact, just to, to show that, to make that point, bottom left there is, is a, a, a DVI um, to HDMI breakout adapter. And that really is just a, a, a connection changer. There's no active electronics inside there. It just you know, adapts one connector to another. Now, moving on a little bit, the last couple of years has seen some real developments. Uh, DisplayPort is, is the current favorite, and that's a royalty-free next-generation standard. Um, you don't have to pay uh, a couple of dollars to anybody if you want to put DisplayPort on your television or your computer monitor, and so that's why it's uh, uh, achieving uptake. Uh, DisplayPort really is a fundamentally better interface than DVI and HDMI, because although it uses the same TMDS data lane idea for getting data from the graphics card or the Blu-ray player up to the monitor, um, 
it allows the sending piece of equipment and the receiving piece of equipment to negotiate how that's done. So you could send, if it was a not a particularly high resolution signal, you could send all the RGB data up one single TMDS data lane. Or if it was a very heavy uh, uh, signal requirement, you could send it up, you could, you could split it like DVI does and send it up all four data lanes. Um, if a display port output detects that you've connected it to an HDMI or a, di or, or, or a DVI monitor, it has the ability to kind of pretend it's DVI and behave exactly like a DVI or HDMI output would do. And so that's how you can have those, those little sort of uh, display ports to DVI adapters. That's how that's possible. The, the logo, bottom right, is, is the, uh, the logo that tells you that, that, that a piece of equipment can do that, that your graphics card knows about ramping down into a DVI or HDMI type of behavior. So the next question that, that, that people ask me a lot is, why can't I convert my Blu-ray disc um, HDMI output and record it on my HDSDI uh, video recorder, my HD cam or my, or, or my HD cam SR deck? You know, why can't I do that in, 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 in my television facility? Maybe, maybe they want to use a piece of footage off a Blu-ray disc you know, uh, before it's been approved or something like that. And this is something that's been with HDMI from the get-go. It's called High Definition Content Protection, HDCP. And it's a wrapper, it's, a, it's an encryption wrapper that, that gets applied to the data that transits over that interface. And it's, it's an industrial strength public-private key cryptography system. If you're familiar with cryptography, um, you'll kind of know about those things. Um, each, each playback device, or, or source, as they're referred to, um, has a device key, and each has has a device key, and, and each piece of content has a volume key. So the piece of content might be a Blu-ray disc, or it might be the, uh, the signal that's being delivered by a high-definition broadcaster to your set-top box. But the combination of those two keys allows the playback device to decrypt the content by, by, by combining them and making a symmetric stream cipher, which then allows you to uh, de-encrypt the content as it transits to the, to the display device. And in fact, the same uh, encryption is applied on the wire as well. So th at no point, the manufacturers hoped, could you interrupt the signal and divert it off to something that could make a perfect digital recording of the content you have. And in fact, it even goes further than that. Um, new Blu-ray discs, uh, and by extension, new over-the-air HDCP enabled content has the ability to carry a revocation list. And the rule says that <coughs> if a playback device gets an updated revocation list, it has to obey it. And so if Mr. Sony, for example, has allowed one of his Blu-ray players to get out that has a hole in its encryption such that some nefarious person could make an uncompressed, perfect digital copy of a Blu-ray disc, the Hollywood Alliance, the MPAA, have the ability to revoke the device key for that Blu-ray player such that any new discs, when they're put in that player, won't play in it. And worse than that, the player is obliged to take a copy of the revocation list off the new disc and keep it in its um, flash memory so that any further discs won't play back on that machine as well. And this has happened a couple of times. The MPAA have exercised their rights, and they have indeed disabled a couple of bits of hardware and a couple of bits of software for, for um, Blu-ray playback on PCs. Now, this is, that's, quite a, that's quite a mouthful to go through when you're explaining to somebody who's just purchased uh, an HDMI to HDSCI converter from one of those fine manufacturers. Uh, and typically, you know, once a month, I get a phone call saying, you specified this HDMI to SDI converter, but it doesn't support HDCP. And in fact, there's no way that a reputable manufacturer can support HDCP in that way. Um, there's no way that Mr. AJ or Mr. Blackmagic could ever build a device that would allow you to turn into an unencrypted HDSDI stream what came off an encrypted HDMI stream, because the following week, uh, Hollywood would find out about it, and the MPAA would revoke those devices, and they'd be useless. And, uh, the person who bought them would be coming back to the broadcast, uh, would be coming back to the reseller and moaning that uh, the piece of equipment doesn't work anymore. <coughs> HDCP, you know, as a display technology, uh, is also built for kiosk applications and those kind of things. And there's this concept of, of um, uh, sources, repeaters, and sinks. A sink is a device that syncs the feed, you know, pr provides a display. Uh, a repeater is something like a distribution amplifier or a switcher. Uh, and a source is the device that's providing the content. 
And in fact, part of the specification says that a repeater has to be able to arbitrate that whole uh, HDCP process. So if you've got four displays connected to a distribution amplifier or a switcher, that switcher or distribution amplifier has to be able to arbitrate the whole key exchange between every single device and the source. And in fact, if only one display device fails, uh, that ruins it for everybody. The whole, the whole chain doesn't work, and you've got to figure out why you're not getting a display on any of your monitors. And it's only because maybe you've got one compromised device. So th that's given us a bit of a, bit of a preamble, a bit of a feel for um, uh, not only uh, HDSDI, uh, well, SDI before it, HDSDI, 3G HDSDI as we find it today, uh, and, and our computer standards, VGA, the old analog standard, DVI, the sort of seminal uh, digital computer display standard, HDMI, how that's been extended, and display ports. But that's great, so long as the workstation's sitting under your desk and you don't have to extend these feeds a long way around your television facility, which, uh, you know, is kind of, you know, bread and butter to systems integrators. Um, and, and you can kind of think about various ways of, of doing that, extending a feed from a workstation to a display. Um, firstly, you could use a, 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 just a long pre-made cable. Um, the problem with that is that we're talking about such high data rates here that pre-made cables tend to you know, work you know, to about 10 meters. Now, lots of manufacturers will tell you that here's a 25 meter cable that works just fine. And in optimal conditions, it will. But uh, should you have this, the wrong model of monitor or, or a particularly fussy uh, graphics card, you find that um, you know, the cable you bought for 200 pounds um, that's meant to go 25 meters actually doesn't, and, and you're lucky if you get 10 meters out of it. Uh, it's a particular problem with Apple monitors. Apple monitors seem particularly fussy about how far they're happy to have a long cable hung off them. Now, there are various models of extenders as well. So, um, you know, people sell extenders that will send your, your DVI signal, your HDMI signal, over a twisted pair copper cable, a Cat5, a Cat6, a Cat7 cable. Um, and to be honest, they work reasonably well, um, but they're not the kind of things that you'd want to have an editor sitting in his edit suite looking at for a whole day. Um, they're just not that reliable. Um, fiber optic cable is, is the optimal way of extending DVI and HDMI, and there's some very good fiber optic balance that, that will take those signals and, and, and preserve them over many, many hundreds of meters. In fact, we've, um, we've done jobs where we had workstations in a facility in Soho, and the operator sitting out in Pinewood Studios, and we, ex we were able to extend their feeds you know, many kilometers over fiber, and it works very well. Uh, another thing that you see done in some facilities is you turn your DVI signal into HDSDI and just distribute it in the normal manner, and maybe you turn it back into DVI at the other end. That, that works for some people. And the, the, the little note I've got there is, is really you've got to think about what you want this, this feed to be used for. If it's a sysadmin who just has to dive into a server once a day to make an email account or to retrieve a file or to clear a print queue, that's fine. But if an editor or uh, some other technical operator has to sit in front of a display for half his life, then it really should look very good and it really should be very reliable. So just as a little uh, sort of takeaway at the bottom there, I've put down the, the, the data rates of um, uh, what you'd expect out of a single link uh, DVI or HD, uh, HDMI signal. And, and so a single link uh, signal will go all the way up to 19, 1920 by 1200 resolution, so a 24 inch monitor, uh, and, and you're looking at about five gigabits per second. And again, there's a little note at the bottom there, which I said I'd come back to it. Uh, uh, TDMS data lanes, that, that, that really is just a, a little acronym, uh, uh, tr uh, Transition Minimized Differential Signaling. It's a way of, of, in, uh, of, of applying a, a scrambling pattern to a digital signal so that you remove DC components so they can travel down a cable more reliably. One for the engineers. Um, so having mentioned that, that you, can, you can, if you want to, extend DVI and HDMI over, over twisted pair copper cable, Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6, Cat7, um, I've just thrown in a little table there that shows you the analog bandwidth of those various uh, types of cable. Uh, so Cat5, which was very popular in the early 90s, um, 20 megahertz of analog bandwidth. Uh, running up to our contemporary standard, Cat6A or Cat7, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty much the same cable, just called different things depending on who you talk to, uh, with an analog bandwidth of 600 megahertz. Uh, and then just kind of compare that to the data rate that you're looking at, five gigabits per second, and you expect that to travel over a 600 megahertz cable, or probably a 250 megahertz cable, because most places aren't yet up to Cat7 cable. So, you know, 
There's a lot that can be done in terms of channel packing and signal conditioning to improve that, but you know, physics still applies, and, and it's no surprise that, that DVI and HDMI don't go down twisted pair copper cable very nicely. And in fact, again, another one for the engineers. There's, there's an output from a, um, a, a fluke test set which shows you the, 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 the typical uh, signal performance down a piece of Cat7 cable. So that's running all the way up to 500 megahertz. And you can see that by 500 megahertz, there's quite a lot of noise on the signal and, and a lot of uh, attenuation is starting to encroach. So I suppose the takeaway from those last three slides is Yes, somebody will sell you uh, equipment that will allow you to send DVI and HDMI over twisted pair copper cable, Cat5, Cat6, um, but uh, I wouldn't buy it personally. So getting on to the next thing to make your life easy as, a, as, as an engineer who's thinking about moving these kind of signal standards around your facility, around your studio. Uh, there's the small matter of EDID. Now, you, you may or may not be familiar with that. EDID is the, is the, data man, is the display management standard uh, that allows a, 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 a monitor uh, or a display device, a, a projector, whatever you like, to communicate back to the sending piece of equipment, the graphics card or, or, or the Blu-ray player, um, what it's capable of. Um, so typically, the graphics card will query the display device. The monitor then responds with its EDID profile. I'm, I'm capable of these things kind of thing. Uh, and, and the profile contains details about resolution, color space, frame rates, all the things the monitor can do. Um, but a common problem with, with all kinds of DVI and HDMI extenders, even the really good fiber optic ones, is that they're built to send a signal from the graphics card up a long bit of fiber cable to the edit suite where the monitor lives, they're not really built for bringing data back the other way. And so some of them do a bad job of it. Some of them don't do it at all. But in many situations, the EDID data doesn't make it back in a satisfactory state to the, the, the device that's generating the signal. And, 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 and what can the graphics card do then? It gets no hint as to what it can drive the monitor at. And so typically, it will default to a very ro low resolution, low frame rate mode, which um, yeah, is never satisfactory. Um, in the case of OS X, uh, so if you're, if you're dealing with, with Final Cut Pro workstations, um, the EDID data gets cached by, by the display um, uh, driver technology within the operating system. And, and you need several reboots to rectify the process. The, so just to show you, that's, that's a, an EDID profile that was captured from a, an Envision monitor. Um, and, and, and you can extract that if you start up OS X in, in um, command line mode with, with, with a, a verbose option when you start up the X um, display system. Now, I mentioned OS X, and, and you know, I'm, 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 I'm no lover of any particular operating system. Um, they all have their place. Uh, but OS X is particularly painful in this respect. That's the, that's the set of steps you have to go through if you get an EDID mismatch uh, on a contemporary Mac Pro workstation. Uh, so there's four reboots and, and, and nine different things you have to pay attention to. And even then, you might have to do it again because it doesn't always stick. So the answer is um, these things called uh, EDID uh, managers or EDID profilers. And ma several manufacturers do them, and they're not hugely expensive. but. Uh, in terms of tech support calls, we routinely put one of these on every machine we sell now, or two, because there's two monitors, and, uh, and, and the tech support calls disappear to almost nothing. Um, and they, they typically just sit in the way of the, they sit on the back of the graphics card, they sit in the way of the signal, and when the graphics card says, uh, you know, please pass me your EDID profile, uh, the EDID manager will pass the graphics card a pre-agreed EDID profile. And the graphics card never gets into this business of trying to guess what the monitor is, trying to figure out, do I drive, drive it at a very low resolution to start with? And both of these devices can be set to whatever resolution you like. Or even better than that, they can grab an EDID profile from an existing monitor, and they store it in flash memory. And, and you can set it so that uh, every time the machine boots up, it always gets fed the same correct EDID profile. Now, the future, DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort over IP, um, a technology whose time has come. No doubt you've walked around the show a bit, and you might have seen several manufacturers are offering um, uh, technology that uh, allows you to package up all those, those two DVI displays and, and, and the USB for the keyboard and the mouse, etc., uh, and put that over your um, computer's network. You know, so if you've got a 100 base T or a gigabit network, um, all this stuff can be packaged up, and compression being what it is, it doesn't present a huge data load, and that can be passed over 
computer network to a small box in the edit suite that's got the monitors and the keyboard and the mouse hanging off it. And all this fiddling about with, with fiber optic cables and extenders and, and, and EDID managers can be a thing of the past. Uh, and in fact, it's a technology that's been around for several years now, um, very expensive until quite recently. Um, you know, almost to the point that, that uh, you know, you'd spend more on, on the, 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 the DOIP technology than you would on the workstation that was using it. Uh, but in the last year or so, there are several manufacturers who've brought products to market, uh, sub £1,000, that do a very credible and good job. And for most applications, it's just fine. There are some some bits of editing software particularly that, that don't get on with it, particularly those that tend to write straight into the, into the uh, display surface in Windows. But um, it's the kind of thing that we're starting to put in in large numbers and um, you know, really is very credible, uh, even, even when you compare it to high quality fiber extenders. So there we go. Um, a quick gallop through uh, you know, contemporary display standards and, and where they all fit into the television uh, workflow, where, where, where they fit into the designer facilities. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, we do several uh, sets of training courses. Um, there are some listed there. TCP IP for broadcast engineers, because computer networks are incredibly important now for, for engineering staff within television environments. And then the kind of courses that you might want your um, technical operators to go on, or your trainee engineer, or your runners who are maybe moving up into being edit assistants, uh, Video 101, Audio 101, and, and Television QC 101. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's really the end of, 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 of this particular presentation. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll happily take them now.